Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, episode 74. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Rabbi Yechiel Kalish. Rabbi Kalish is not only a rabbi and a cantor, but he's also a Demo- was also a Democratic mm-hmm. member of the House of Representatives for Illinois. He currently lives in Farakaway, New York, with his wife and family, and holds a master's degree in public administration mm-hmm. from Walden University, as well as serving currently as the CEO of Hevra Hatzala, the largest volunteer ambulance service in the United States. Yechiel, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Naftali. It's good to see you. It is really good. And, and people don't know this, but we spent many years together when I lived in when we lived in Chicago. And I know you've That's been right. back and forth, yeah. Midwest, New York. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I'm really interested on this podcast, of course, and the focus is leadership. So what's what's of great curiosity to me is you've run for profit. I think you still have interest in a for-profit business. Um, an advocacy and lobbying business. Um, you obviously have played a leadership role in the political realm. And for many, many years, I think the first space that I really got to know you on a professional basis was your advocacy work for organizations, specifically Jewish organizations, both in the Midwest and then out East, and now currently one that runs um, one of the largest volunteer networks, well-known in our, in our community, really helping people in, in medical and other forms of distress. So I'm curious to know from a leadership standpoint, what would you say is the primary difference between running a for-profit business and running a nonprofit? I think by, by, the, by their definition, um, uh, a for-profit you know, uh, is there to provide uh, resources to its shareholders. Um, but a nonprofit is mission over money, right? So by its core, um, a for-profit is uh, supposed to earn money, right? That is the main goal of why an individual starts a business. They may do it out of passion. Uh, they may do. They may choose a certain profession because they are passionate about that profession. Uh, but the ultimate goal is to provide for uh, themselves and their families. Um, but money over mission, but money over mission, uh, you know, if you're, if, if you're really happy doing what you're doing, but you're not bringing any, uh, support home to your family, your family may say, we're really happy that you enjoy that. But, you know, that's not why we're letting you be out of the house for 20 hours a day. Um, but in, an, in a not-for-profit or a charitable organization, it's mission over money. And uh, everyone understands that there's a level of sacrifice um, that uh, that one chooses to be part of such a mission. That's awesome. I've never heard mission over money before. I love it. We'll have to figure out how to incorporate it here in these conversations. Um, but let's, so let's drill down a little bit further. So, you know, in my mind, mission is really important and it's a great motivator and it pushes people to do things far beyond what they might typically do for themselves. But at the end of the day, it's not enough, right? At the end of the day, there are other factors, other complications. Uh, leadership can be complicated. So what, what do you find works for you to motivate, to engage, to keep people focused on what needs to get done outside of the mission itself so that you're really running? Because you're running a big organization with a significant budget, a lot of locations, a variety of places. I want to get back into that shortly. How do you keep everybody engaged in that mission when maybe they're losing sight of it? Um, I, you keep everyone focused. I mean, that's that's really that's really what it's all about. Constantly motivating, constantly keeping uh, everyone focused, constantly reminding uh, people uh, why we do what we do. And when it comes to Hatzalah, um, it's a little bit easier, uh, simply because once you save a person's life. Um, it's an adrenaline, um, and it's something that you want to do again. Uh, when an individual has saved uh, another individual's life, that is the only motivation that they need forever 
uh, to um, get them up in the middle of the night, uh, get them running into a burning building, uh, get them uh, heading over to a call uh, as quickly as possible because they know what that feeling is like. Their friends have, either they know it or their friends have told them what it's like. There's very little motivation necessary. Uh, in fact, I think I spend most of my time uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to de-escalate uh, situations. No, the person has a cut finger; they are not going to die. Right? So, uh, so we can we can we can approach the situation uh, a little bit calmer. Uh, but uh, but but really, we have uh, a very good structure within Hatzalah, um, and uh, we are constantly. Uh, having training seminars, constantly uh, engaging with our members on so many different levels to increase their education and increase their motivation. So that actually brings me to an interesting question because I was, as I've moved further and further into my leadership focus, one of the big ones that uh, resonates with me is the idea of managing by walking around. So that was made popular by the founders of Hewlett Packard, Packard that they would constantly be present in their facilities. People would see them, they'd get to have one-to-one -one conversations and just being present created that sense of management, that sense of oversight and really provided the leadership that people needed. In your case, it sounds like the leader almost doesn't need to provide that because people have it intrinsically. So does leadership change for you in an organization like Hatsala compared to where you were before where maybe there was less intrinsic motivation and what then do you focus your attention on instead? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we, we, we are, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of Hewlett Packard um, and maybe that's because they had a factory. Um, uh, but once they, maybe when they started, once they started, once they started growing and uh, had multiple factories, I would, I would find, um, I, I would, I would challenge that premise. Uh, we, 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 are, we are everywhere in New York City. I mean, we have 14 neighborhoods uh, throughout the city. It's absolutely impossible to be everywhere at once. Sure. Uh, the, reason, the reason that, we, that our, um, our response time is so legendary is because we have 1,600 members and 200 paramedics uh, uh, throughout the city of New York. So therefore, the chances are when someone calls us, uh, we're, we're around the corner. So, um, you know, so in, in, in that sense, the, the role of the, of the leader is to make sure that um, all of our members have the resources that they need to do their job properly. So that could be uh, relationships with the fire department, with the New York Police Department, with the uh, mayor's office, um, with, uh, you know, uh, the, the different uh, uh, community leaders uh, to ensure that um, when our members go on their call, they are uh, they're unencumbered um, and that they can go directly uh, to saving a life. So uh, from a from a day to day perspective, um, that's what I'll provide. And that's what our team at Central Hatzel will, will provide. And from a leadership perspective, um, you know, we'll be out there on issues of the day, such as vaccination uh, and other medical crises that may uh, that may come up uh, regarding COVID, et cetera. Uh, providing cover uh, for and providing direction uh, for our members, um, you know, uh, as they seek it. Uh, but, sure. Uh, that's but, interesting. Uh, yeah. because you mentioned New York City, of course, and that's where your um, your, your presence is strongest. And I know Hatzala has, I don't know if it's official, unofficial uh, branches elsewhere, but regardless. No, no, they are, they are, they are quite official. Uh, oh, okay, good. They are quite official. You, yeah. you mentioned New York, but I, I I am aware we that own, we, we own the name Hatzala at Central Hatzala. And for okay. someone in the United States uh, to open uh, Hatzala, they have to have a licensing agreement with us. Um, and I spend a lot of my time protecting and preserving the name of Hatzala. Uh, the name of Hatzala is, for those who know Hatzala, um, the name of Hatzala is a very holy name. Um, and it's a very important name and it means something. When you hear Hatzala, again, for somebody who knows Hatzala, grows up with Hatzala, you you think of immediate care, right? In the same right. way, in the same way, uh, an individual thinks of nine one one, right? And someone outside of our community who thinks of nine one one, they think there is a comfort in those three digits. Uh, there is a comfort in the name Hatzala, 
Uh, I remember and, when I was growing up, I had a teacher, maybe multiple teachers, um, Torah teachers who were also Hatzala members. This was pre walkie talkie days, even they had these beepers and, uh, and, and they'd have, they literally get paged in the middle of class and they go running to a payphone and they have to dial in and find out where this, where the emergency was. So it's it seared in my memory from, from my youth and anyone who grew up certainly knows it as well. I'd like to circle back Yechiel, to something you talked about before, which I think expands into a variety of places that you've been professionally. Uh, and that's about relationships and relationship building. So you talked about relationships with the mayor, uh, with the city to make sure that uh, there's no bureaucracy, there's nothing impeding your ability to do your very best work and have access to resources. But you've had to build relationships everywhere you've been in the house, in the house, in the, um, in the Illinois assembly, um, you know, previously in your work for advocacy for the um, Jewish communities of the Midwest, Chicago in particular, lots of relationship building. And a lot of it isn't just, you know, who do I need to talk to in the moment for the crisis at hand or for the issue at hand? A lot of it is having a vision, right? A lot of it is sort of cultivating relationships because you never know when you might need them. But you want to work on it regularly and steadily so that when that moment of truth does arrive, you really do have a repertoire, you really have a, a significant group of individuals you could turn to. And again, a relationship should not be all about right what's going to ultimately be for me, but right. I'm trying to understand more from your perspective, what is your secret sauce, let's call it, <laughs> relationship building, because you've done a lot and you've done it really, really well. I remember those years you'd send out those flyers and you're sending matzo boxes to politicians all throughout Minnesota and who knows where Wisconsin. So, so tell us a little bit more about that. Cause I think regardless of where our listeners are in their own personal lives, as well as in their businesses, they want to know how to build strong relationships that will serve the other person, but also serve yourself. What is it? Maslow who, uh, who says that the seven, uh, Hierarchy of needs. Hierarchy of needs. What's the what's the what's the basis of uh, well your physiological needs are at the bottom, yeah. Uh, physiological, but the trust is pretty high up there, right? Trust is uh, is basically one of the uh, one, one of the foundations. And um when 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 you're starting out, right? I guess when someone's starting out um and they want to get to know everybody, right? That, that's what you were saying, like sending matzo boxes up to everybody. Uh, but once, once one is experienced within their, uh, given field, um, I, I, I did, and I imagine others do as well, get a, get a, get a certain feel, uh, for individuals that you're interacting with on a, on a regular basis. And you, and you, you get a sense that this is, this is someone very, uh, trustworthy. This is someone who uh, can get something done. Uh, this is someone that I want to be associated with. Um, for multiple reasons, either because I like to associate with individuals who accomplish things, who mm. have a similar drive and a vision. I love that. Uh, and, and, and that's really, that's really paramount. Then there are office holders, right? Um, so there are, or offices, sorry. Then there are offices. I need to have a relationship with the mayor of whatever. Sure. Right. But I may not want to have a relationship with that mayor, right? Those are two different things. Um, I need to have a relationship with the mayor, office, the office of right. the mayor. I need the to entity. have a relationship with the, the entity. Um, so, so therefore, I've always focused on the for the the really the the, the former rather than the latter. Um, because let's say the person who ends up in that office is not someone like Rod Blagojevich, for example, right? That's a great example. Rod Blagojevich was the governor of Illinois. I never wanted to be in the same room as him. Um, he, but it was impossible to do my job without having, without working with the governor. So there were enough people that I had built up relationships who didn't mind being in the same room as this individual um, who could help. So um, that, that's really where, uh, how I've focused. I've always wanted to try to develop relationships with people, um, like the Rambam says, you know, right? The, the reason that you're acquiring a friend for yourself, right, is to raise both of you up, 
Um, so if that's your motivation, then it's not transactional. Then it, we're, we're working on this together. And then when, yeah, when something comes up where I don't have a relationship with this individual who ended up in this space where we actually need that, uh, you know, office, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll have, you'll have a friend right now. I'm thinking, you know, uh, I don't have a relationship with the current secretary of state, right? Um, because he is an individual who uh, I didn't want to, as he was going through his career, have you know that type of relationship, even though it was possible. But I need to right now. I, I, I actually need I actually need this. So we have enough relations. We have enough people that we know uh, each other. So you know we're trying to move. Uh, I'm trying to move in 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 that direction. Um, with the with the Secretary of State, so that's very interesting. I love the piece on making the relationships non transactional. Really, I think authentic, and people can sense it. I don't know that there's anything sure. I can point at and say it's this, it's not that. Especially in fundraising, especially yeah, in for sure. Right. If you, if somebody feels used, they will not. Uh, no matter what, you, no matter how authentic you try to be, uh, but if you aren't, they will feel used and. Uh, you will not uh, you will not succeed in your fundraising endeavor, right? Because you talked about trust, and trust is really in many ways just about the human connection. You know, people want to know that you have the capacity to do what needs to be done, that you're dependable. I use the ABCD model often from Ken Blanchard: able and dependable are the A and the D, right? Do I have the ability to do the work? Am I dependable? Or can I be relied on to do the work? But the B and the C are believable and connected. Right. right. People need to be believable. They need to feel like that there's there's a sense that um, that what it is that we do um, is is genuine and then the connection is strong. And when that is in place, a lot of other things really can happen. So I, I'm curious, maybe give us a pointer because you've had to reach out to a lot of people. I'm sure a lot of them were folks you had no pre-existing relationship with. Maybe you did it through a third party. Maybe you did it on your own. Give us uh, a couple of, of tips of cold networking, of connecting with people without pre-existing relationships that will allow us to expand our network. And also, also your, if you're willing to give us your, your secrets of this trade, so to speak, um, what criteria do you use other than the entity, other than the office, to determine who it is that you want to be connecting with? Like, what do you look for in a person? I mean... Uh, the the number one, you know, to answer your first question, I I, I knock on doors. I mean, I literally knock. I literally knock on doors. Uh, oh, so, that was you, that was you yesterday. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, front door, man, uh, front door, front door. If if I've identified that the, this is someone that I just pick up the phone, I call, I reach out, I email, I, I you know, I, I needed to get to a, a certain billionaire a few years ago. Um, because he had a relationship that uh, uh, we needed to uh, to leverage on behalf of an important project. Uh, I, 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 that that secretary basically gave the meeting to me uh, because of how uh, insist, you know, <laughs> consistent and insistent I was. I call it pleasantly persistent. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, you know, so I'm, I'm a big front door person. Um, I'll, I'll also, I'll stalk I'm a big stalker, uh, you know, or I was. Uh, You're scaring the audience. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning that if I needed to understand, if I needed to get in front of an individual and they were, uh, and whoever it was, was preventing that from happening, I would find out where they were going to be or, or what their daily schedule is and show up. Uh, so again, front door, this is who I am. This is why I'm trying to get a hold of you. Uh, do you have a few minutes to talk? Wow. Um, so, uh, so that's, uh, that, that's really, it's not, you know, like, uh, like, like people say, how do you lose exercise? How do you lose weight, you know, diet and exercise? It's not complicated. Uh, how do you develop a relationship? You call them up, <laughs> you know, you find them, uh, you, you meet with them. Um, how do you identify, you know, the, those individuals, you know, the, the, the second class, again, that goes back to what we said earlier in terms of either, um, you know, uh, People, people who are capable of getting things done uh, or people who uh, occupy offices uh, that will uh, assist you in, in, in whatever your goals are and hopefully assist them, you know, especially in the public, in the public space, uh, public officials, for sure. Uh, they're looking for 
Um, uh, they're looking for uh, uh, different types of projects that they can go back to their constituents and say that they, uh, that they got this done. So if you are a resource for that, um, so that's something that they're ultimately looking for as well. So that's interesting because I was thinking about something you said a moment ago. You know, look, there are a lot of people who um, will, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm neither a billionaire nor a politician, nor the most important person in any room typically that I walk into. But at the same time, there are plenty of people who want to get my attention for a variety of reasons. Depending on who they are, the nature of their pitch, et cetera, I will often just, I don't, I don't mean it in a snobby way, but I'll just stonewall it because it's, it's, not, it's, just, it's just noise. And if I allow myself access to everybody's noise, then I'm not going to get the things done that I need to do. So my question is, yeah, you worked, you worked your magic with that secretary and you were able to get through, but outside of persistence, I'm sure you hit up a lot of walls of resistance along the way. So right. is there anything, because I was thinking to your last point, that when you can demonstrate that a relationship with you would add value to the person you want to be setting up the meeting with, that's going to make them more eager to participate, right? They're going to want to know what's in it for me. So what, what do you, do you use that approach? And if you do, how do you present it in a way that allows it to feel like a win-win? It's all about them. It's all about them. When, when, when you're making a presentation, uh, my name is Yechiel Kalish and I'm here to help you on this project. Um, and, you know. Even when you want their money or their connection? Yeah, whatever, whatever it may be. I mean. Uh, How do you why do I, why do I want? Across? Why do I want their money, right? So, so I, I want their money because I need to make a mortgage payment. Um, no, I, I I want their money because we're working on a certain project. I want their money because and this project is important to their community. I want their money because uh, you know I want to get reelected to public office um, to assist them uh, in their goals uh, to make sure that the community is well represented in Springfield. So what, whatever the whatever the answer. Whatever the whatever the cause uh, that I'm talking to them uh, about, it's really regarding them. Right now, we're raising money for a new radio system here. That's all well known that we're doing that. Um, so the individuals who have expressed interest are individuals uh, who this is they want for their legacy. They want to make sure that when a Hatzalah member picks up the radio uh, to save somebody's life, they are getting some sort of heavenly reward for every one of those. That's something they want. Sure. Who wouldn't want, that? Uh, who wouldn't want to be a part of saving somebody else's life? So, that, so that's easier to do when you're talking about Hatzalah or even, right. or even p- politics. Let's translate that into, into a company's line of work. You know, we hear about knowing your why. We understand that from a business standpoint, you should have a purpose. But how do I present to a consumer where it's in their best interests to engage with me. How does Coca-Cola do it? Um, right? Coca-Cola. Question, you tell us. Coca-Cola is 30, what is it? 50 grams of sugar uh, in, uh, in every can. Uh, you know, uh, several hundred calories uh, for, for every drink. That doesn't sound very healthy. But when you look at their advertisements, um, they, they make you feel refreshed. They make you, they make you feel refreshed. They make you feel good. They make you feel like, ah, this is pleasure. Um, so while it's inherently bad for you, right, their pitch to you, it's all about you. And it's all about how you are going to feel uh, in the end. Um, so when you actually have authentic goodness, uh, when your company or um, your social service or your charity is actually going to provide real goodness and the pitch is to make the individual feel good about themselves uh, or feel uh, pleasure uh, in the entire process. Uh, so the, you'll, you'll have a much greater chance of success. Just for the record, uh, all legal disclaimers, I don't think Hatzel attracts how many of its, um, the people that they serve necessarily came to them through sugary drinks. No. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but we we do that. Not but, I would, that but I would I would encourage uh, asking. <laughs> fair fair enough. All right, so I want to I want to hit on one more leadership piece if I can sure. before we transition. Um, you know, I, I was I always think about this from you know as the house the House of Representatives, whether it's national or on the state level. You know, you've got hundreds of people in a room, 
Each one has one, vo one vo uh, vote and one voice. How they use it, how they're positioned, obviously will vary by member, but it's very different. You're CEO of a, of, of, of a, of a nonprofit, you're a mission-based organization, you clearly feel your impact. When you have a for-profit business, you clearly feel that as well. But when you're one of hundreds and your vote clearly is not going to, unless it's an unusual circumstance, you're not going to be the sway vote. Uh, you're not going to tip the scales in one particular direction. How do you stay motivated um, you know, to really put your very best self forward? And how do you demonstrate leadership when you're not at the top? Because one of the things that I think are really critical for people to, to think about and I do workshops on this all the time, is not just leading, quote, top down, let's leave alone if that's even the right metaphor, but leading across, leading down, up, across, because leadership really does go in all different directions. So I'm sort of thinking about it in this way as well. You've got peers, obviously, you're trying to get a certain agenda across. Talk us through a little bit what leadership looked like for you as an individual in that context. So, so, so there's really, there's really two point. There's really um, two sides to the question you're asking. Um, number one is, as it relates to um, being a lone voice, so to speak. That's that is not true, um, because uh, you are the leader for 108,000 people uh, when you are standing in that room. There's 108,000 people that are expecting you to press a certain button uh, on that, uh, on your desk when that bill or whatever it is shows up or vote a certain way in a certain committee. So the moment you press that button, the moment you give that vote in committee, 108,000 people or those of whom, from that 108,000 people are, are paying attention, know about it and they care. Um, so, so number one, you are not alone. You are not in a room of 218 people as I was uh, in the House of Representatives. You are there to represent your 108,000 people and they know about it. Uh, so, so therefore, every single vote is highly significant. Not a little bit significant, highly significant. The results of the bill, that's, that's secondary. That goes to our next section. You know, if you are an individual, like I had, an, I had a chance to sit with the governor um, when I was uh, in the legislature and he called me into a meeting because he was trying to pass a certain piece of legislation. And he called me in and he says, you know, um, I've heard that uh, in the breakout room, um, you have been talking positive about this piece of legislation. And I heard that from other members. So I'm asking you as a favor to work the floor on this uh, piece of legislation to convince your colleagues to uh, come out with a uh, positive outcome. Uh, and I did. Um, and, and that's where, um, and we passed the bill. Uh, and, and that's where leadership can find itself in a room of 118 uh, to get the result uh, mm. that you're looking for, right? So there's two things. There's one that every bill matters, every piece of legislation matters. You are not alone. There's 108,000 people paying attention to everything that you do in that room, right? And then there's, okay, I know my constituency is going to like this bill, but I have to convince others, right, to go along. So therefore you work the floor, you work the and leadership qualities uh, and trust and all of those different skills that uh, I've, I've developed or I've, God has uh, uh, given me uh, opportunity to develop, um, you know, come out and come forward. And then those individuals who, who stay longer in, uh, in, in these roles will end up as chairman of committees uh, chair and uh, leadership uh, on, the, on the floor or within the party. Um, and so therefore their voices or the voice of their 108,000 people is amplified even more. Because, again, don't forget, right, uh, don't make the mistake of so many, uh, you know, uh, former members of uh, the House or the Senate uh, who thought that they were bigger than their constituents. Think Eric Cantor, right? So, you know, you could be the number one, number two man in Washington, but if those 400,000 people that he represented were unhappy with him and his votes, he's no longer. 
So uh, this, so that's that's really uh, you know as it relates to an elected official, uh, that's the right way to uh, to think about. It. Yeah, I love it, and I would love to go deeper on it uh, as well, especially this idea. I remember once when I was head of school, so um, there was something we were trying to advance. It was a behavior program, uh, without getting into all the specifics. And I had one teacher that was resistant and somewhat vociferous about it in in the public space, so to speak, of a teacher's, of a faculty meeting. And one teacher who is relatively quiet and kept to herself and typically did not weigh in in these conversations, she pipes up and she says, we've already discussed this. We've already agreed to it. Let's move on. And that was it. I needed to say nothing else. So right. Sometimes when you have that leadership happening or you cultivate it as the leader within the proverbial rank and file as well, then you don't necessarily have to fight every battle it gets engaged for you, which is really neat. So let's transition here if I can. Let's stay on the House floor for the moment um, because I'm sure there's all sorts of interesting things. <laughs> this is this is our rapid fire, so we're gonna go short and sweet. The, the, the most humorous or strangest thing you heard out of a colleague uh, during your time on the floor. And you don't have to identify that person by name because I know there's some things out there that are just not legal, they're just... <laughs> The strangest or most humorous thing. Um, yes. <laughs> there's a lot. I mean, there's <laughs> so much. Sure. I'm sure. I didn't want to give you yeah. a chance to prepare yeah. for this. Well, uh, probably the strangest thing uh, was when um, uh, the uh, the house was advancing uh, a, a bill for uh, for some, uh, some 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 drug that that you that I guess somebody takes to protect them from uh, an STD. And, uh, you know, uh, one of my colleagues came running over to me because I'm the rabbi to uh -huh. explain, uh, you know, oh, this is an STD. This is all, this is what the drug is. This and everything. And I think like, I, you know, I, what is yeah. <laughs> I'm an American. I grew up. Right. I'm, right. I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't live in a cave. Right. <laughs> I'm not yes. a fan. I'm a yes. rabbi. Indeed, as well. Yeah. All right. So the main difference, I know you've been all over the Midwest, uh, Cincinnati, Chicago, elsewhere, uh, and of course, uh, currently in New York City. The biggest difference between the two. The biggest difference between the Midwest and New York, New York City. Yep. So I I'm an East Coast kid. So uh, when I moved to Chicago, everything slowed down. I mean, it may be the second city, but it is slow. Uh, you know, compared to uh, to New York. So yes, yeah, speed. It's all about speed. Yeah. Okay, so staying on the topic of speed, I ask this of everyone now because I'm focused on it and I'm writing a book on the topic as well, a productivity tip that'll help us get more done. Uh, turn your phone off. Turn your phone off. Do not disturb on your office phone and turn your phone off. Just curious, how, go a little bit deeper. When do you do it and for how often? I mean, for how long? Every day, whenever I want to get work done for hours. Got it. Turn your phone off. I was wondering why you didn't answer yesterday. Now I know. <laughs> now I know. Okay, Yechiel, it's been a pleasure. Uh, before we go, give Lead to Succeed Nation an opportunity to learn more about your work, your work as an individual, but I think in many ways, more importantly, your work on an organizational level, communal level. How can they reach out to you? How can they find out more? So Hatzala.org, H-A-T-Z-A-A-L-A-H.org, uh, Hatzala.org. Um, that's our, our website. Um, you know, uh, give us a, give us a call, give us a ring. Uh, happy to talk to, uh, to anyone uh, who, uh, who listened to this podcast and wants uh, some more information. Um, but uh, ultimately, Hatzala is uh, an, an organization that is focused on uh, the saving of life. Uh, and I always tell people that we answer, you know, when we answer the call, uh, we ask two questions. Uh, number one, what's your emergency? And number two, where can we find you? Uh, and if you think about that in, in your own life, uh, you know, when, uh, when someone's calling you for help, right? Maybe those are the only two questions you should ask. Um, you know, what, what, what's your emergency? How can, I, how can I help you and where can I find you? Because the, wow. difference, the difference in doing something in person uh, and, and reaching out to someone saying, hey, I'm gonna come over and really help you through that uh, challenge that you're going through, probably make a big difference in that person's life. That's great. And if I may for a second, I don't know that too many of my listeners know this, but I'm actually a rabbi as well. So from one rabbi to another, since we are having this conversation, just a couple of weeks before the high holidays, I think those questions are really, really profound. What's your emergency? 
and where are you located? And I think that they really speak to not only our physical needs, but also our spiritual needs and sort of like fine tuning our mission and purpose, no matter what it is that we feel we're here to do, uh, to take strong stock in our status and to figure out where we need to move, move uh, go on moving forward, so to speak, uh, to recalibrate and to take that next step. So before we go, Yechiel, your final okay. life lesson, please, to, uh, to wrap up our conversation and uh, to point us in the right direction. Humility is the internalized awareness with every fiber of my body that everything that I have is not my own, rather is a gift from God who bestowed his kindness upon me. Wow. Okay. We'll have to leave people to just sit with that and let them unpack it. Okay. Yechiel, it's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. you have much continued success in all that you do. And uh, hopefully uh, the good folks of Hatzala will only participate in, uh, in, in, in success moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank I, you, Nathalie. Great to see you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 